Well, it's finally happened. It's Quentin Byfield season. We're going to talk all about our top prospect on today's episode of Locked on Los Angeles Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Sarah Avampato, host of the show, and as always, glad to be here with you as we look forward to the latest action from the Los Angeles Kings. And uh, the big one, the big thing we've all been waiting for, we've all been wondering, when is Quentin Byfield going to get called up? The answer is today. Uh, Quentin Byfield officially called up by the Kings, and uh, the team has already confirmed that he's going to make his season debut uh, with the Kings tonight against the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, Byfield has played 11 games this season with the Reign. He has six points in those games. Uh, All of them have come fairly recently, uh, and he is... uh, he is ready. If you'll remember, uh, obviously, Byfield was slated to begin the season with the Kings, uh, but he broke his ankle in the preseason, uh, and then he came back to the rain and played like, what, one, two, three games, and then he got COVID, and then he missed some time because of that. But he is back, he is healthy, and he is ready to go. Um, I had the opportunity to go out to uh, Ontario, uh, see the rain, see him in person, and what I saw was a player who can still dominate the ice when he is out there. He is quite often the best looking forward uh, when he's on the ice. I also saw a player who still has a learning curve. There are still some times where you're watching him and he doesn't make the right choice. He doesn't make the right play. He's not always necessarily where he needs to be, but he's also 19 years old and has comparatively pretty little professional experience. And at this point, both for Byfield's development and for the Kings, I'd rather him start doing that learning up with the Kings. I'd rather get to see what he has at the NHL level, let him start to get to learn the pace of this game, get to learn the physicality of this game. The game that I was out there for in Ontario uh, that I saw against Henderson, uh, you know, there were a lot of people kind of physically taking advantage of him, which you wouldn't really think for a guy who is, you know, 6'4", 6'5", or whatever. But, you know, the other team knows he's the best guy on the ice and the other team is going to target him. And uh, you know me, you've listened to the show, you know that I'm not exactly the uh, everyone drop the gloves and let's fight it out kind of person, but also, you know, wanted to see a little bit more response from the rain uh, with Byfield getting a little pushed around. But I, I don't think that that, I don't think that's a reason to not call him up. And I think that's something he's going to learn at this level. I, I thought that you know, watching him in Ontario, watching the Reigns' recent games, you you got the sense it was only a matter of time until he came up uh, to play with the Kings. Uh, because like I said, I think that there is a lot of merit in being patient. I have no issue with the, the patience the Kings have exhibited with their prospects. I think that there is, you know, a point where you do you know, you need to make the best decision for the prospect. And sometimes that best decision is not bringing them up to the AHL because they're not ready or not shoving them onto the first line because they're not ready. But I think that a, like I said, for Byfield and his development, this is the right choice. And for the Kings, this is the right choice. This is a team that looked like they were back on the right track. They lost that game against Vegas right after the holiday break. And the team even kind of said, Hey, like we use that game as motivation to bounce back to really like use that game as the the example of what we needed to not do the example of what we needed to overcome and how we need to play and they bounced back from it for a little while uh and then they completely fell apart uh over the past couple of games against the sharks which we won't talk about slightly better showing against the tampa bay lightning uh, except for all the miserable special teams work and then that game got out of control but that bounce back that we saw that we were very excited about because the kings went on this very strong run of play including torching the penguins who are one of the better teams in the league uh, and then again just totally fell apart against the sharks who are below us in the standings and against the lightning so this team needs a shot in the arm this team needs something and some of the players need to sit and so we're going to see that 
in the game tonight uh, because both Alex Turcotte and Rasmus Kapari are going to going to sit this one out. It looks like um, no issues with that either. Uh, I have been watching Kapari in particular, who started the season very strong, but seems to be kind of in a slump uh, and have been wondering what it would take to uh, remove him from the lineup, even temporarily. And it uh, looks like we've hit hit that moment. So Byfield is, uh, it looks like he is going to be centering Carl Grundstrom, who is also back in the lineup after being out on COVID protocol uh, and Dustin Brown. So a little bit of third line action, but I would also expect to see Byfield jump up on the power play. I'd expect to see him take big minutes because you know what? Why not? Let's throw him in there. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the Kings and their game tonight against the Colorado Avalanche coming up after this. But first, let's talk betonline.ag because it is a new year. It's a new betting year and sports are continuing their march to the playoffs. They're continuing to uh, get ready for their new seasons in some cases, whatever it is. We've got sports action. BetOnline is the number one spot for all the best sports wagering action for 2022. And it doesn't matter what sport it is. If it's football, basketball, hockey, boxing, fighting, casino games, TV shows, weird things, you can take advantage of all the amazing offers available for this year. It is, of course, a new year. They've got a new website you can see on your phone, on your computer, and you can go there, sign up today at betonline.ag and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code locked on to get started. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports, so check it out. BetOnline.ag, promo code locked on, and go get started. Bet Online, where the game starts. So we are seeing the Colorado Avalanche tonight, who, after a little bit of a slow start to the season, have bounced back to become the dominant Avalanche team that we have all come to know and hate over the past couple of years. Currently, the Avalanche sit first in the Central Division with 55 points, uh, kind of close behind them, Nashville and St. Louis, both with 51. Uh, the Avalanche are, get this, 9-0-1 in their last 10. So good luck, I guess. They've won their last four games in a row, uh, and we get to take them on now. Uh, last night, the Avalanche were over in Anaheim, where they won two to nothing, which quite honestly is a score that could have been uh, much worse were it not for Ducks goaltender uh, John Gibson. Even though the Ducks outshot uh, the Avalanche, the Avalanche certainly had uh, the better chances. Pavel Frankuz was the goalie in net uh, for, for that evening. So that means we're going to be seeing uh, the other goalie for the Avs. We're going to be seeing... Darcy Kemper, old friend Darcy Kemper, who is 17-5 and 1 on the season, uh, really helping to, to drive the avalanche forward. If you somehow have forgotten, Darcy Kemper, Los Angeles Kings legend, uh, played here uh, 19 games he got into back in the 2017-18 season, uh, and uh, then we traded him to Arizona for uh, four cursed years for him. That's most likely who we're going to be facing. He has always done well against the Kings in, uh, I can't believe it's not Staples Center, uh, back during his career with the Minnesota Wild. I, I feel like he was dominant, particularly against the Kings. Maybe not always other teams, but against the Kings for certain. Uh, that's why it was so great to have him on our team for one year, because we knew that he uh, wasn't going to beat us in those uh, games. But he's going to be starting for the Avalanche tonight, unless anything you know totally bonkers happens. Another thing about the Avalanche that I did not know, uh, their leading scorer, Nazem Kadri, believe it or not, 51 points in 34 games for Nazem Kadri. He just got the nod to be the uh, Central Division's last man in for the All-Star game this year. 51 points is not quite a career high for him. He put up 61 in 82 games in Toronto back in 2016-17, uh, but this is his highest uh, points total since the 17-18 uh, season, uh, and he still has over half a season to go. Again, 51 points in 34 games, and probably most importantly is that he's been playing on the right side of the line. This is a guy who, particularly in Toronto, was always sort of known for 
crossing that line in terms of dirty hits, in terms of being cautious and aware on the ice, uh, has his share of suspensions, has his share of repeat offender status. But he really, particularly since coming to Colorado, uh, has become a little bit of a different player. And this year is really, it seems a little crazy to say this about a, you know, 31 year old player, which also is crazy because that's not old, but this is kind of a breakout season for him. He is just absolutely providing, I think, above Colorado's expectations in terms of uh, performance. Uh, he leads the team, like I said, in points. He's above Miko Rantanen with 46 points. Nate McKinnon has 40 points. Uh, Makar, Landeskog, both 37. This is a team that is so deep. I, I hate them. They're so deep. Uh, they have so many players in terms of like double digits in points. And they have the depth to really be uh, be difficult <laughs> to play against. They also have Curtis McDermott, who is a forward now, which is funny, if you ask me. He's been playing forward for the Avalanche. Uh, it's working out kind of well. Although if you look at his uh, time on ice, uh, well, this is funny. If you look at his time on ice for this season, not great, not great. Uh, it's generally under seven minutes a night uh, against the Ducks, five minutes, 24 seconds against the Wild, four minutes, 26 seconds. Uh, played a lot against Arizona for some reason. Game before that, five minutes, 10 seconds, four minutes, 18 seconds, three minutes, 26 seconds. Like this is ridiculous he is clearly being used in that go out punch someone and have a good day role which is you know what he's here for but like four minutes of ice time he had one game he had two minutes and 53 seconds of ice time like what are you going to do in that what do you what's what is the point he didn't even take a penalty in that game like what is the point of trotting him out there for three minutes but we're probably going to see him tonight. I don't want to speak it into existence, but I'm going to be real. A uh, Curtis McDermott, Brendan Lemieux fight would be hilarious. Uh, McDermott did fight last night against the Ducks with frequent sparring partner uh, Nick Deslaurier. Uh, those guys have fought something like, I don't know, five, six times already. Uh, the one last night was a pretty, pretty heavy bout uh, between them. I got a lot of people talking, but uh, they're familiar with each other. Remains to be seen if McDermott's going to find a willing partner on the Kings now, but uh, Lemieux is usually the one to jump up for that call. But uh, we may be seeing old friend, uh, Seattle Kraken legend, Curtis McDermott in the game tonight uh, with the Avalanche. But like, again, his like average ice time is sad. It's sad. And, uh, he is there for one specific reason and generally is a non-factor in things. Uh, coming up next on the show, we're going to look at what the Kings need to do to actually win this one and get back on the right uh, path going forward. Uh, we're going to talk about that next on Locked on Los Angeles Kings. All right, I've said it before. I will say it again. I will say it until, like, I don't know, they yank me off of this show with one of those giant prop cane things. This team needs to play their game. This team needs to not fall into the trap of what the Avalanche want them to do. Too often we see this team, when things start going awry, it's like they abandon everything they've ever known. They abandon every plan they have ever had in terms of what they should be doing to play good hockey. And they let the other team dictate the pace of the game, dictate how things are going to go. This team needs to be ready from puck drop. Um, as boring as that game against the Lightning was the other day in the first period, where it was like each team had four shots on goal, that might be what you have to do to grind out a win against the Colorado Avalanche. If it means playing the most boring, stupid defensive game for 58 minutes, fine. While the Ducks were ultimately unsuccessful in their game last night against the Avalanche, you could see that that was kind of their plan too. Uh, the only goal scored against them that wasn't an empty netter uh, was an ugly goal. It wasn't something pretty. It wasn't something scored off of like a high danger fancy shot. It was just an ugly goal. And that may be what the Kings need to do. They need to get guys in the blue paint. They need to get guys up there 
taking away like it, i hate i hate the fact that like the key to winning is all the stupid hockey cliches that we hate but you need to get guys up in front of the net you need to make sure that darcy camper kemper can't see what's coming at him uh and you need to be aggressive i feel like some of these games that i've watched from the kings again hate hate this cliche hate it so much but they haven't been hard to play against they have been not as strong in the corners, not as strong on pucks as I want to see them. They have been slow to play with any sort of fire or emotion. Uh, and we saw that in the game against the Lightning after that very dull first period. Eventually, they kind of got things together. And sure, they ended up losing. But in that second period, in the third period, we started seeing them respond in the right way. They were playing physical, they were playing fast, uh, they were making things happen. And I don't always put a whole lot of stock in the like, get the other guy off his game thing, but sometimes you gotta do that. Sometimes you need to keep pestering the other team. You need to be up in their business all the time. And the, the Avalanche are, I'm not gonna call them like sneaky dirty. I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't go that far. But the Avalanche certainly have become a much more physical team over the past few years. I know they're a team that was always kind of hailed as, especially since they became, you know, relevant, relevant again uh, over the past handful of years, kind of hailed as, you know, the future of the NHL, all younger, faster players, more skilled guys than heavy guys. And that still is mostly the case. I mean, Curtis McDermott aside, uh, the Avalanche still are relying much more on their skill with the puck, on their shooting skill, on the creativity of their forwards, their puck moving defensemen. We haven't talked about Kale McCarr. Like, ugh. But the Avalanche are that kind of team. They are a team that is smart, and now they have added sort of an extra dimension of physicality to that game. They have Curtis McDermott. They have Nazem Kadri, who, like we said, has turned things around in terms of you know, not getting himself suspended, but he is still a very physical player. They have Gabe Landeskog, who is well known as a guy who is not afraid to throw a hit. Uh, Miko Rantanen laid like a ridiculous hit on someone in this game against the Ducks. So they have their share of players who are not afraid to mix it up and get dirty. And it gives the Avalanche more ways to win, which is kind of what I'm seeing from them. It gives them you know, okay, maybe this game they're not going to win just from beautiful shots and Nate McKinnon being ridiculous. Maybe this game they're going to win because they bullied the other team. And so I think that the Kings also need to be aware to not let that take over the game and to not let that get them off of their stride. Because once things start getting chippy, things devolve very quickly, usually. Of course, the last thing I wanted to touch on and we can't talk about the Kings without talking about it, is, oh my God, why are special teams so bad? So bad. This is like unbelievably bad from the Kings this year. Their power play, currently 25th in the league, 16.7%. Their penalty kill, ho buddy, 29th, 74.1%. The only teams below them, the Arizona Coyotes, who are bad, the Winnipeg Jets, who are mediocre, and the Vancouver Canucks, who are bad. 74.1%. On top of that, not only is the penalty kill struggling, not only is the power play decidedly mediocre, but when the power play does get out there, uh, they're allowing goals. The Kings have allowed six goals shorthanded. Uh, that is tied for first in the league. They're up there with the Devils, the Flyers, and the Sharks. Six shorthanded goals against because if you watch the Kings power play, they basically have two strategies. One is the drop pass. I hate the drop pass. The drop pass can go away. Otherwise, they just try to send the puck into the zone. And if they can't get into the zone, they dump it in. And they chase after it, like which is a waste of time on the power play. Watch opposing teams, particularly good opposing teams, when the Kings are on the power play. Because what happens is they realize the strategy that the Kings are using. And then they just stack three guys up on the blue line. And then the, then the Kings can't get in because there's nowhere for them to go. And they either have to dump it in or the other team gets possession, they turn it over, play goes the other way, bam, shorthanded goal. Like that is so frustrating. And the thing that's the worst about it is there has been no like inclination of any willingness to change. We're not seeing the strategy adjust. We're not seeing players necessarily put in their best positions to succeed. 
I'd love to see more creativity on the power play. I'd love to see, you know, something other than what we've been doing. Like with the whole like definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for it to be different. Like, that's what we're doing with special teams. And if anything is going to sink this team at this point, I mean, there's lots of things that could, but right now the special teams are just a killer. Imagine if the Kings hadn't allowed those six shorthanded goals a lot. Imagine if they had not allowed like even like 10 less goals while short, while shorthanded, like we could be much more secure in our spot. How many games have the Kings, Kings lost that have sort of hinged on poor special teams performance? Uh, it's, it's a number of them. Um, right now, the Kings, in terms of the standings, they're still second in the division, in the Pacific division. The Ducks are tied with them at 45 points. Ducks lost last night, so that's good news. Uh, Sharks are right behind them with 44 points. So, like, we're in the territory now where we need to keep winning. We need to keep finding ways to win because the teams behind us are breathing down our neck. Vancouver's out. Edmonton might as well be out. I don't know how they come back from this. Uh, Seattle, done. Calgary could jump back up, but right now it's Vegas, the three California teams, Calgary. Those are your top five teams in the division, Uh, and they're separated by six points. Vegas, 48 points. Calgary, 42 points. Not a lot of wiggle room, so we're in a position where we need to win games. (laughs) and need to keep pace with our opponents and uh, with the other teams in our division. And you're not going to do that with the totally miserable special teams that you have right now. So uh, there's the keys to the game. Play your own game. Figure out what's wrong with your penalty kill. Maybe try a power play goal or two and uh, hope for the best. So we'll check out the game tonight. We're going to, like I said, hope for the best, hope for a win. Uh, Very excited to see Quentin Byfield and what he can do uh, as he jumps back into the NHL after getting his feet wet in the AHL this season. Uh, Tomorrow, uh, we'll be back to check in on uh, how this game went. Uh, The Kings, in terms of their schedule after this game, they head out on the road. Uh, New Jersey Sunday, Rangers Monday, Islanders later in the week, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, all coming up. So this is going to be one heck of a road trip that the Kings need to come away with two, three wins at least. Uh, They also play Detroit, and then they take a little bit of a break uh, before fitting in some of those rescheduled games from the uh, COVID stuff uh, in in February. Uh, But the Kings need to come off of this road trip in a strong position if they want to continue to try to hunt down that playoff spot. So that is it for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Thanks for being here. You can find me on Twitter at right said Sarah, the shows on Twitter at locked on LA Kings. Of course, love to hear from you guys love to hear what you want to hear about in future episodes of this show. Make sure you're subscribed. If you haven't already tell your friends all about it and come back tomorrow and every day for more Kings news here on locked on Los Angeles Kings, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day.